All right. So, yeah. Thanks again for having me. Thanks for inviting me, uh, Muad. It's it's yeah a great uh, a great honor to to speak to such a, a big and nice group. And yeah. So, all right. Welcome to the talk MLOps monitor ML models in production. So today I'm going to focus on one specific part of MLOps. Right. So MLOps is a really a a big topic and today I want to focus about uh, on monitoring ML models in production and well also not in production. Again thanks to all of you for joining. Um, I probably need to hurry up a little bit um, to fit all the talk in my time slot but yeah buckle up for a while right it's gonna be uh, uh, fast in, in some um, pieces. So um, uh, but I think we have some time for for questions after the talk so i will answer all of your questions then um i would say all right let's get started then again hi i'm i'm hauke um sorry for this rather historical photo it's like from the pre-covid era where i still wore suits and went to an office so and i i wore pants every day that were really crazy times Oops. anyway uh, as Mort already told you, I'm a senior software engineer at a startup called DeepUp, um, and I build software, so mostly microservices that then run in Kubernetes. And I mostly do this with Kotlin, but also, of course, with Python. And I'm passionate about machine learning. That's why I'm here. And that's also why I'm working on bringing the best of software engineering into the world of machine learning. I had to promise my colleagues that I would definitely tell you just quickly about what our company actually does. So DeepUp is a deep tech startup with headquarters in, in Bonn, also um, yeah, more of Northwest um, Germany. Um, but we are pretty spread out inside of Germany and uh, a little bit remote. Um, and I'm here really in my, in my country estate in the middle of the forest near Hanover. And we are over 60 people in, in the team. And of course, we want to go further. Our goal as a company is to completely automate measurement of newly laid underground cables and pipes and data lines. So we have developed a device that can measure entire excavations and, and trenches for cables in 3D with centimeter precision. And this data is then processed in the cloud using machine learning, of course, and then made available to communication companies, civil engineers, network operators as documentation, 3D models and line plans. And that means that our customers always have an overview of the construction progress. And we prevent the next excavator from just pulling out the fresh pipeline right back out of the ground. And we do that faster, easier, and more precisely than with all other previous methods. So that about a company. All right, enough advertising. So really, let's get started. Today, I'm going to talk about monitoring machine learning models in production, but actually, I have a better title and the better title would actually be way I deployed my first model to production, but OMG, why is the performance now suddenly much worse than it was in training time for some panic? Oh, oh wait, no one tell me beforehand which metrics I should pay attention to and what tools are they actually and how do I deploy a new model version without breaking anything and which model is currently in, uh, running in production? But as you can see, this title is a little bit too long. So um, yeah, some character limit problems. Also, it's really hard uh, to actually fit this title in my head. Yeah, but to make the feeling from this rather long title a little bit more tangible, I will tell you a small story. So we probably all have been there. We've spent weeks or even months working on our ML model and we collected and processed data, tested the different model architectures and spent a lot of time fine tuning the hyperparameters of the model. And then our model is ready. Maybe a few more tweaks to further improve performance, but it's definitely ready for the real world. Then finally, the model is put into production and we sit back and relax, or rather we continue working on a new project, right? But then after three weeks, we receive an angry call from our customer because the model makes predictions that no longer have to do anything with reality. So yeah, that's mostly time for a little panic. We start looking at the logging. Everything looks fine. Server is still running. Model is delivering answers. Yeah, the only problem is if we only rely on the logging of traditional DevOps metrics, or if we have no monitoring at all, then we don't know what is happening with our model in production. Deployment to production is really not the end of a machine learning project. In fact, it's just, uh, just another phase in the project. So we are not done when we have deployed our first model into production. And that is really a very important point that I really want to emphasize again today. And I want to talk uh, to you about what are 
different problems that the ML model can have in production. And then I want to present approaches on how to identify these problems in time and what we can do about them. And, and by the way, um, if I have links to papers um, or other stuff on my slides, you don't have to take uh, screenshots. There's one big link at the end uh, with a list of all the other links. So no problem there. Okay, so what does the life cycle of an ML model look like? So in the business context, we always start with a problem or a use case. We don't just do it for the research fund, right? Then we have to check if we have the right data and do a lot of data cleaning and feature engineering. And then comes the fun part. So finding a suitable model architecture and training the model. And then, yeah, well, we just have to deploy the model into production. It's quite easy, isn't it, right? Well, yeah, but small problem here. This is a pipeline. This is not a life cycle. But what should a life cycle look like? It's important that we feedback findings and data from production. For most projects, that's a very manual process at first, not an automatic one. But we need to do two things. First, we need to assess the results and the impact that our model has from a business point of view and decide if the model needs to be updated or if we might need a whole new model, right? And second, we need to collect data in the production environment and feed it back into our training process. If we build ourselves a robust pipeline to do that, then we can even do that automatically. So the initial round of the life cycle from use case to deployment, that's really just the first step in the project. And all further cycle passes are the part of the project that takes the most time and where the model actually spends the most time. So who actually takes care of the individual steps in the life cycle of the model? Well, of course, the use case and the questions come from business, right? And the training in the model architecture clearly falls into the area of data science. And depending on how big our team is, there might be even data engineers who take care of data management and provide data pipelines and ETL. And then deployment and embedding into the surrounding systems is clearly the domain of software engineering and DevOps or MLOps. This really depends mostly on your exact role definition. I have often seen very loosely defined borders between these three roles, right? Okay, and then who takes care of monitoring and maintenance? Well, you might say, okay, yep, uh, monitoring, that's ops, so DevOps people should do that probably, but it's not quite that simple. I will come back to this question of who is actually responsible for models in production, but keep it in mind for now and uh, think about it already, right? Quick note. Um, the way that I put it is that business and data science and DevOps are three different roles. But of course, there are also intersections between the individual roles and people who fill several roles at the same time. And then when you find a person who can do both data science and DevOps and is also able to understand the needs and processes of the business, then you have really found the magical MLOps unicorn, right? And if you should ever meet this mythical creature, then weight it up in gold, chain it to your desk and provide it with plenty of snacks and drinks, right? So mm, back to topic. Mm, why is monitoring and maintaining an ML model so difficult? The first challenge is really that we are not only interested in the ML model. We need to think about the whole machine learning system. The model is, of course, a very central part to the machine learning system, but it's only a small part when you compare it with all the processes around it that you need in a real production system. So be it data engineering or monitoring or the actual deployment server. But for successful projects, we need to look at the overall process and the overall system. So the next challenge is that our system consists of many, many moving parts. Like any software system, ML systems consist mostly of code. Well, and that brings all the inherent complexities of code. And then we have the model and the data. And it's not like we can just say, okay, yeah, we have now two additional dimensions that we need to keep track of. All this stuff is really intertwined after all. So if I change one input feature in the training data, then the relevance of all the other features shifts as well. Or if I change hyperparameters of my model automatically with some auto ML magic, then I really get a complexity um, in there that is really, really hard to grasp. So those were the technical challenges, right? But if that weren't uh, already enough, we also have multiple organizational challenges. Who is responsible for monitoring and maintenance? So data scientists, maybe? They don't necessarily know how to motivate the Kubernetes cluster to behave appropriately. DevOps, well, 
as a DevOps person, I personally have no idea what the first signs of declining performance in the model are. Data science and DevOps together? Yeah, sounds good, but can they decide what we do with uh, when our predictive accuracy drops by 10%? Is that a bad thing? If we do fraud detection, then yes, probably that is a bad thing. If we recommend new books to our customers, yeah, maybe not, maybe it is. I don't know, but we need to have business expertise on board for that to decide if it's actually a problem. And why is monitoring so important? Well, traditional software works just as well after a month as it did on the first day. Of course, there are maybe changes in memory and CPU requirements, and of course, bugs will occur, but the basic behavioral characteristics of the productive software do not change. So with machine learning models, that's really different. For these, the quality decreases over time and a model that works in a production environment and is not retrained will degrade over time and will never achieve as good a predictive accuracy as it did on day one. The world outside of our machine learning system is always changing and so does the data our model receives as input values and the accuracy of the predictions it can make and that is called drift. And what types of drift can occur? For this, let's look at an ML um, model and how it makes predictions in a more yeah, schematic way. We have inputs that are applied to our model in some way. We have the distribution P of X and the model then makes a prediction. Here it's 87% uh, sure that the label should be cat for some reason. And let's call the distribution of prediction values P of Y hat. We now return this prediction to our user. In this case, maybe the prediction was wrong. And through the feedback channel, the user returns us the correct label, the ground truth. The distribution is P of Y. With the prediction, we can now determine the prediction performance of our model. Okay, and with this schematic out of the way, we can really talk about the different kinds of drift. First, there's input drift. So we look at P of X here. Input drift is where the distribution of our input data changes from what our model saw in training. This can be really due to several reasons. For example, there may have been a change in our user demographics or some other change outside of our systems that we really just can't control. But these types of changes will then mostly occur gradually. But if an abrupt change occurs when work is being done on one of our systems, then there may be another reason. A change in maybe the data dependencies. Our model may get variables supplied by an other internal or external systems. The systems can, of course, change the way they calculate data. Or data fields that was previously filled is suddenly empty. If that doesn't lead directly to a hard error, it will at least significantly change the prediction of our model. If it does not, well, then we need to ask ourselves, why did we have this feature in the model in the first place? In any case, we should keep an eye on changes in the distribution of input features. Then there's prediction drift, P of Y hat. For example, our model previously identified 99% of all components on a production line as suitable for really production use, but now it only identifies um, 75%. So it's really a significant change in the distribution of prediction values. What can we do about that? Even if it sounds a little bit unintuitive at first, again, we should first take a look at the distribution of the input values. Most of the time, a change in the input data is really to blame for the change in prediction distribution. This change is really then just a symptom of a mismatch of the training and production data. Or maybe our data pipeline in production is slightly different than the one for the training data. However, there's one particular time we should keep an eye on um, when we notice changes in the prediction distribution. And that is when we just deployed a new model. Then maybe our training pipeline have produced a broken model. And this is really yeah, nearly uh, the worst case. It could also be the case, maybe, that we simply deployed the wrong model to the wrong server. I heard that this had happened before. Okay, but we have one big advantage in monitoring and detecting input drift and prediction drift. We can use the data that arrives or arises on our um, ML service anyway. For everything else, however, we need ground truth labels, and that is a little bit difficult. In our training data, of course, we always have pairs of input data and labels, but it's different in production. Here we often don't know what the right label is, or we only get that much, much later. Very often we have really long feedback cycles. For example, if we want to predict um, default probabilities for loans, 
takes a long time to get feedback here. Or if you want to predict the quarterly results of companies, well, then we have probably to wait three months um, to uh, have the quarterly results, right? Only logical. Second problem is um, that we can have a case where we never get complete labels. So for example, if we implement fraud detection, we will reject potential fraudulent transactions. That's fraud detection. Then we have created ourselves a what if case here that we really can't resolve unless we let a certain percentage of fraudulent transaction pass as experiment, but business normally does not like that. But if we do image recognition, for example, there is one way to get complete labels with some manual work. We already have collected input data so we can manually label random or precisely chosen input data. But this is yeah, rather expensive. But if we have then collected labels, then we have the possibility to analyze the distribution here as well. If we observe a change here, it can simply be that all of a sudden, all of our users upload cat pictures instead of dog pictures. That on its own is not so interesting. If it becomes, uh, it becomes interesting again in connection with the input data. Because if we find that the input data stays the same, but the label, so what really happens changes, then we have a concept drift. And that leads to a massive performance change in the prediction quality of our model. As annoying as the whole COVID or Corona stories, at least provides reasonable and very immediate examples of concept drift. Before beer was meant, now probably not. Or there are far fewer air travel requests than usual for this time of year. Toilet paper demand, on the other hand, could be skyrocketing. Who knows? Concept drift is a problem that we therefore have to keep an eye on, especially in recommender systems. Uh, systems. Because another problem that we can encounter in production in recommender systems especially is a feedback loop problem. For example, when we have yeah, built a system to recommend products to our users and they, we then capture output of this, um, of this system and see um, what, um, what is um, suggested by the system. Um, and then we see what the user actually bought when stuff was suggested. And with this data, we improve the model. And then we can very um, easily get into an out of control spiral here. If the recommended product is bought more and then it's more recommended and then it's bought more and then it's more recommended and so on and so on. We can counteract this by additionally um, recording the position at which the purchased product were displayed to the user and waiting in that as a feature in our model. All right, now we have seen what bad things can happen to a model. So we should monitor uh, our model. If you weren't convinced before, I hope now you are. But how do we actually do that? So that's really the, the part of the talk where I talk about tooling. Um, first, small overview over the large tool landscape. <clears throat> but really, these are only examples. And of course, without any claim to completeness. So if someone has a feeling that I have not listed their absolute favorite tool, so please write it down in the chat. It's really interesting. I'm always eager to learn about new interesting tools. If uh, any of you works for a company that produces a tool for ML modeling, um, monitoring, please um, sound up in the chat um, or later in the, in the Q&A. Uh, I'm really interested to hear about all this nice stuff. Okay, tool landscape. Basically, we can divide tooling into three categories. Do-it-yourself solutions, special products, and cloud platform solutions. With the do-it-yourself solutions, they are basically two set categories. Again, the classic DevOps tools, Prometheus, Grafana, Elastic Stack, and then there are other tools that are actually built for monitoring ML. Selden Core, for example, is not only a serving tool, but also brings monitoring cap capabilities, and there's also active development in this direction. And then we have stuff like, evidently, and with that, you can build wonderful monitoring dashboards and reports and contrast the results from training and production. And then there's a the whole category of explainable AI tools, for example, Eli5. So however, they don't answer the question, what does my model do? But they try to answer the question, why did my model do that and came to that decision? The second category are products spe uh, specifically designed for MLOps and monitoring for machine learning like Supervised AI, Fiddler AI. However, most of the products I know of cover more than just the monitoring area, but they also try to cover other areas of the MLOps pipeline. So it's really 
really hard to find you uh yeah hard to find only special purpose built tools for just monitoring ml models then we have one third category and these are the tools provided by the major cloud platform providers so g cloud aws azure i hope nobody from from ibm is here and is now a little bit angry um so there we have cloud monitor and SageMaker and azure monitor for example with the hosted and non-open source tools of course you always have to make a trade-off and this trade-off is between convenience on the one hand and the lock-in effect that occurs and of course there are ml applications that you can't or you, that you shouldn't host with other providers right i'm well i'm from germany and of course we are always a little bit um data privacy um yeah have, have a special relationship to data privacy right so I really need to say that there is stuff that you shouldn't really host with other providers that you you rather want to keep in-house. Okay. So to give you a little help in deciding if you're saying, okay, do I want to buy a tool or do I prefer to do all of it myself? I'm going to show you a small blueprint um, for monitoring solution with Prometheus, Grafana, and some other tools. So that you get an impression of what is really necessary if you really want to build a monitoring solution, a comprehensive monitoring solution by yourself. First, we start with our model, right? Fully trained model. It's running in a model server, so TensorFlow Serving or Selden or Kubeflow. Or in the simplest case, we just wrote a little Python Flask service that calls a model. The model server then gets input data from a user or from another application that we have connected to the ML service. Then the model makes a prediction and returns that to the user or app. So far, so easy and no monitoring here. For the server itself, we of course monitor metrics like CPU or GPU usage, memory footprint um, that we have when our model makes production uh, predictions in production. And we store these metrics in a Prometheus instance. We also store the prediction of the model with associated confidences. So what does the model think the correct prediction is and how sure it is that this is really the correct prediction? Little side note, if you build a service that generates images with, with GANs or something like that, then we really should not try to, to store this prediction, so this generated image or a video or whatever, um, in Prometheus. That is not a good idea. So the tool in which we store the predictions must always be in tune with the generated data type. So for a generative model, rather um, maybe a logging service like Elasticsearch or even a file storage. So some, some G Cloud bucket, um, for example. Um, and then we can just write the file ID along with the rest of the metrics in Prometheus. That's a better way of handling um, bigger uh, prediction uh, files. So. Um, the confidence information is really very useful if we want to retrain our model later on, especially specifically training with data that our model is not quite sure about. Our model server generates logs. Um, so who accessed which API and when? Which version of the API was called? Did authentication or authorization fail? And we store these logs, for example, in Elasticsearch. We either write them directly there or with an appropriate logger or have logs dash fetch them. Of course, if we are on G Cloud, for example, then we could also take big query as a log storage. But we also want to store the inputs we get from our users. Again, it depends on what we get as input data. If we only get small or structured inputs, then we can store the inputs in our metric store. But if we get text for NLP uh, applications or images, then it makes sense to use uh, the logging service or even, again, a file storage. So we now have input data and output data, but we need to do something with it. The easiest way is to build some dashboards first. Sounds relatively simple, but it's actually very, very useful because we as humans are much better at dealing with visualized data than with tabular data. And many things can be seen really well, right? Sudden drops in model confidence, change distribution of input data, or change distribution of predictions. When we talk about visuals and dashboards, this is the part of monitoring that is actually done by humans. So it's really a uh, human in the loop monitoring, right? And that is what we do with Grafana. We can plug Grafana together with all the other systems relatively easily. Prometheus is of course the clear favorite for collaboration, 
but there's also no problem with elastic st uh, stack. So I said something like human in the loop monitoring, right? Then there really must be something like human out the loop monitoring or maybe machine in the loop monitoring, right? Yeah, sure, there is. Uh, but we first need a machine for that to do that. In this case, it's a drift detector. It gets the output data from the metric store and the input data from the log store. And then what is very important is that the drift detector needs a baseline. Otherwise, it has no base to detect a drift from. We need to supply it with this baseline from the training data. Of course, this works especially well if we have a feature store such as Feast. In it, we can pick the training features of our current model and its predecessors and potential successors in a very neat and versioned way. And then we can either calculate simple statistical values or use the complete arsenal of some statistical tests. But I'm not a mathematician, so I leave that to somebody else to explain uh, what you can do on statistical tests for, for drift detection. Or... Okay, then regarding the more simple stuff. Um, of course, we still need a service that detects certain deviations in metrics. So confidence drops to 3% with a new model version. Well, then some action is clearly needed. We would have to implement that drift detector and the metrics monitoring ourselves here in our dual uh, self uh, example, but with ready-made solutions. This is of course included or it should be included. So if you are deciding to buy a, a ready-made solution, then that is something you take uh, take a look at. But what we uh, have to do in, in either case is that we have to define certain threshold values. And when these threshold values are crossed, then we, we can do something, we can do alerting. So even though machine in the loop monitoring doesn't require someone to look at the dashboards all the time, at some point, we still need to alert a human. We can do that via PagerDuty, Ops Genie, email, Slack bot, everything at once, depending on how urgent it is. But what we need to keep in mind, with every alert that we send, we have a potential UI or UX problem because we always have to consider who the recipient is. I'm sure all of you can be woken up uh, at three in the morning by an alert and that alert tells you to interpret some Kullback Leibniz divergence uh, or whatever, and that's not a problem for you. But for me at three in the morning, I'm glad by this time I can remember the password to my MacBook, right? So we need to think of our alerting as being understandable first at three in the morning and second to non-data scientists, understandable to non-data scientists. And the more present possible actions are, so the better the actionability of the alert is, the better. So a link that takes me directly to the right dashboard, for example. And maybe don't use Comic Sense in, in your alert. That would also be a good idea. Or maybe do so it rightly pumps up your heart, increases blood pressure right in the morning so you're fully awake and ready to act on... Uh, on the alert and uh, interpret whatever um, the, the alert tells you to do. Okay, so with these tools, we can keep now an overview of what is happening with our model. Another aspect that I want to touch very briefly on is the question, how did our model actually come to this decision? Especially with deep learning models, that's not very easy, right? Of course, there are some tools like Eli5 mentioned earlier that try to make the black box of models a little bit more transparent but there's something else that we can do for traceability of ML models. In order to really shed some light on this, we must at least be able to understand which features and data were used to train the model. Was some bias introduced in training? Did someone mislabel data? Do we have a bug in our data cleaning pipeline? These are all things that in the worst case, we won't discover until we are in production. For us to even have a way to debug such cases, we need to version not only the model itself, but everything that led to its creation, monitor the currently active version and make them transparent to all stakeholders. To track our data or our features, we can use tools like DVC or Feast and our final trained model can be versioned, for example, in Pachyderm or another model registry. Now, of course, you might ask yourself, hmm, well, somehow that really sounds like a model in production is really just a burden. Well, that of course is not true because only if the model is in production, it delivers business value, right? 
And besides, there is no better way to improve a model than when it's deployed in production. And there are two approaches to improving production models besides, well, I just collect more training data and then I completely retrain a new model. And these two ways are one, online learning. So we have the, the possibility to say, okay, we now build a self-learning system, an online learning system. So it's nearly, nearly AI, right? Um, so we continuously update the model on a data stream. That is good if our hardware and our model architecture supports it. For training, especially for large models, we often really want to use different hardware than for inference of, of, uh, of data, right? And how do I know with online learning that my model will not be trained in a completely wrong direction if it's continuously trained? Right? The alternative would be active learning. For this, we observe our model and look at which inputs it has a low confidence on. We can then retrain um, these, these special cases. Of course, we have to label these special cases by hand. But at least we have inputs, predictions, and the confidence levels by way of a monitoring. And that means we actually have the chance to do active learning. What is also nice is since we are in production, we have users who are confronted with our model and who also have a real interest in our model being as good as possible. And we can involve these users. So basically a simple, well, this prediction was wrong button that can be really, really helpful. Okay, so now we know how to detect when the performance of a model is declining and we can do something about it. If in doubt, we retrain the model with fresh data, completely freshly trained model, but then we have to put the new model into production. But when exactly do we do that? And there are a few approaches here. First is really on-demand deployment. So I have my artisanal handcrafted model and that has just received the finishing touches. And then it's yeah, time for my 15 page deployment checklist. Hey, yeah, that's a little mean, right? But on-demand deployment is actually the approach you mostly start out with. And it's the only one you can follow if you don't have an MLOps pipeline for automated training. So we deploy once and then we deploy again when we have a new model ready. So really on demand. Then what we can do next is periodically retrain and redeploy a model. That is really just the next simplest approach. We choose any interval like daily, weekly, every quarter, only at full moon on Tuesdays for retraining the model. And whatever interval or point in time you choose, you then know exactly when a new model is delivered. But this depends very much on how often you get new training data. There's really no point in choosing just any random time just because it fits in uh, some, some kind of release schedule. This will only add unnecessary complexity if the timing is unfavorable or you can get even worse performance than the previous model. So that, yeah, be really careful if you do just, uh, just interval-based um, retraining. What you can do what is much better actually is a performance-based approach. So a new redeployment is triggered by falling below a certain performance threshold. The model continuously deteriorates after the initial deployment. And if the model performance falls below the defined threshold, then it's retrained. But this approach assumes that you have reasonable monitoring and that you are able to train a new model at any time. So for that, you need a really stable MLOps pipeline. And there are really two difficulties with the performance-based approach. First, you have to decide a threshold value. That is the easier, uh, the easier problem that you have here, but it requires a little bit of intuition. But the bigger problem is to be able to determine performance, we need ground truth labels. But if we have to wait like, like three months for the labels, then we won't be able to detect decline in performance for at least three, three months. And then we won't be able to deploy a model for that long. So this approach is very well suited, but only for use cases where it doesn't take long to get ground truth labels. By monitoring our input data in production, we can detect changes in the distribution of the data. And we can also use that as a trigger for retraining. If the input data changes substantially enough, then we probably need a new model or a new model version. Of course, then we need label data as well. But in the worst case, we can label the data manually. So it's really the more active learning approach. But we don't have to rely on getting labels to trigger our training. 
So we could say, okay, we even trigger the training as soon uh, as we have enough labels to retrain the model in a more automated way and achieve uh, a higher performance than the current production model. All right, these are the multiple um, approaches to deploying models or uh, time slots where you can apply, um, deploy new models. But with that, I have a question for you. Um, it's a little bit awkward point. So think about that. What is actually your emergency plan? So what do you do if a model in production delivers totally wrong values, but you have no new or better model available? Do you have something like, I don't know, a circuit breaker that automatically takes the ML service offline? How do your surrounding systems handle this? I would be interested to know if you have any interesting uh, emergency um, model failover strategies. And please let me know in the chat or later in the Q&A. I'm really interested how uh, you are preparing uh, basically for, for, for the worst case uh, with, your, with your model. I really have the feeling that this is a topic that not so many people have thought about yet. One strategy to make this case a little bit less likely are these two rules from Google's Rules of ML Guide. Um, building ML ops workflows must always be an evolutionary process and cannot be done in a one-time Big Bang approach. A possible approach here can be to create an initial prototype without ML components. Then one should start building the infrastructure and then very, very simple models. From this starting point, we then can use our created infrastructure to advance in small and incremental steps to more complicated models and lift them right into productive environments until we have reached the desired level of predictive accuracy and of performance. If you take this evolutionary approach, then really a step back is not as difficult and painful as with the Big Bang approach. I'm, I'm yeah, uh, near, near the end, um, but towards the end, I would like to talk about deployment strategies. How do I get my new model in production safely? How do I detect potential problems as quickly as possible? A very yeah, classic deployment strategy is really blue-green deployment. For this, I have deployed two ML models and a gateway that can switch traffic between these two model services. Before switching, all my traffic is routed to model A, and then I switch, and all my traffic now goes to model B. I can do that at a very specific time. And uh, at this time, I watch my monitoring really, really careful. And if something is wrong with model B or if model B underperforms, then I can quickly switch again back to, to model A and uh, be, be online with my machine learning system again. Deploying shadow models works a little bit differently. I also deploy two models. Model A is the production model. It receives input data and delivers predictions to our customers. And model B is the shadow model. It's a new model which performance I want to test and that I possibly want to put in production. This model receives data and makes predictions. But the predictions are not sent to our users. So I can test the behavior um, of the model with really production data and production load and compare the predictions of both models. And then there's A-B tests. Right, you probably all know A-B tests um, work a little bit differently. Yeah, I have several models in production at the same time. The goal here is really to perform uh, for um, to, to do performance comparison between two models or other experiments. I segment then my traffic out based on certain characteristics and then direct it to either one or the other. All right, so I'm almost done. So quick recap. When we have put our first model into production. We are really not finished. In production, many challenges are waiting for our model. So data drift, and concept drift, negative feedback loops, all this fun stuff. And never will the model perform as well as it does in training. On the other hand, a productive model is ideal to collect data for active learning. In the end, training data can only ever approximate the real world and the real feature distribution um, can only be seen in production. Monitoring machine learning models is really not easy. Of course, we will also monitor the traditional ops metrics like requests per seconds, response times, CPU and memory utilization. But unlike traditional ops monitoring, we have a much harder problem to solve. When monitoring ML systems, we are ultimately monitoring a stochastic process, so our model, right, and not just discrete values. So we also have 
to pay attention to distributions of a matrix and data and to collect, prepare, and manage them. And for this, we sometimes need special tools and we sometimes have to build these special tools by ourselves. The, the whole tool landscape for MLOps is really in a state of flux right now. And there are no fully established strategies yet, I would say. Please correct me in the chat. Um, finally, for the last time, who is responsible for monitoring machine learning? In the end, it's really all stakeholders. So MLOps or DevOps has to develop and deploy the monitoring and also the model. Data science has to interpret the monitoring and correct the model. And business has to trust the whole process and to make informed decisions with that information in it. And this trusting and making the informed decisions, that is probably the hardest step in the whole process. All right, that's really it. Yeah. Thank, thanks you very much for, for listening and, and, and being here. This is the promise link. Um, I, I don't know if I'm pointing in the right direction, but the, the big link, uh, Hauke.me ML monitoring, there you can find links to all mentioned tools, to all mentioned uh, papers and white papers and all this stuff. Um, and I also stole a meme from Reddit and adapted it. So I'm yeah really looking forward to to a discussion. I, I think there were uh, already a few questions in the chat. I will try to, to, to find them. <laughs> and I think we also have, um, we have something in the FAQ. Um, ah. So um, let's get started first with the question from the FAQ and then I will scroll to the chat and answer all your questions there. Um, I think that is a good strategy, so, so I hopefully don't forget anything. Um, and we have a raise 10 from um, Muti, is that right? I don't know if I can uh, give you um, give you a free microphone. I have no idea how that works here. Um, if you have a question, just type it out in the chat. I think that this should be probably. Um, all right. So. Um, FAQ. So, uh, Tim asks, have you used ML monitoring in multi-cloud environment? Uh, sorry, Tim. No, unfortunately, I, I, I haven't. But um, the, the, yeah, I, I think the really, um, the really challenge is there that you have to do everything um, for every cloud environment, right? And then the, that is the really complex uh, thing you have to combine um, multiple uh, sources of data from multiple cloud environments and probably you want to to combine this in one cloud environment but actually take it with a grain of salt I have never done this before I've uh, always been um, mono cloud um, I think and um, yeah um Great. So, um, Woody, um, are you taking into account potential malware infection impact and um, and using your software to cause damages? Ha! Huh, yeah, that is <laughs> that is always a um, um, a concern. So we have um, now uh, another vector for attack, right? Um, we have all the all the um, the potentially dangerous stuff uh, that we have with normal software, right? You can um, have um, yeah, malware or um, uh, security risks across all your production pipelines. So um, in every step of your software development process, you can you can have bugs, you can have uh, security holes, and um, you can also um, load in some potentially dangerous uh, dependencies or libraries. Um, that is a problem, um, but you have um you you can address this with traditional um methods for that i'm not a, also not a security expert how did i say that i'm not sure if i'm an expert in anything really uh, well um but you uh, you can use the traditional tools to mitigate uh, these um these problems but then there is really um the problem of adversarial attacks on ai and that is probably a problem but more with publicly available models if you um if you shield your models a little bit so if 
if the public does not um, interact directly with your models, but is, um, your model is encapsulated in an application, then you have potentially um, the uh, some some possibilities to to mitigate uh, attacks there. Um, for example, it, it could be simple stuff like just just rate limiting, for example. But because if you really want to try to adversely attack an ML model, you need more than one try, right? You always have to, um, you need, really need to deeply understand actually the ML model and either you need insider knowledge for that. And if an attacker has insider knowledge, then it's game over, right? Um, but um, for, for I think for all other attacks, you need uh, at least multiple tries. So yeah, rate limiting or um, some other uh, limiting could be a good idea. Okay. Um, Andrew, uh, it seems model production is an extension of the sandbox that was used for model development. Um, if true, then can the measurements from monitoring be used to retrain the model in an automated continuous loop? Yes. Um, yeah, um, that is um, yeah, actually the, really the, the, the best thing you can do. You can gradually improve um, your, your model with, um, with an active learning approach, for example, collecting, um, collecting data uh, in the production environment, see where your model um, has, has some weaknesses, uh, does not perform uh, as good as you think, and then improve uh, these steps. Steps, no, these, um, <laughs> sorry, on these, on these inputs and for these special cases. Uh, I, I hope that answered the, the question. Um, oh, no, then, I, I hope then it's fair. Hmm. Hi, have you ever considered, I, I'm sorry for butchering your name, I'm really very, very sorry. Um, Hi, have you ever considered Airflow and or MLflow? Um, yes, um, but um, currently I'm a big fan of Argo workflows. Um, I, um, I work on um, Kubernetes most of the time uh, for my ML endeavors, or we as a company actually. Um, and we are currently working with, with Argo workflows for that. So it's a, mm, a little bit lower um uh lower level for for the for the pipelining stuff um as an airflow i think it's more yeah, more directly coupled to kubernetes and um yeah and for us it's currently working great so it's really really enjoyable um it's if you understand kubernetes a little bit it's really easily understandable it works reliably for us and scales really well ml flow yeah um yes uh, I, uh, but um, MLflow we currently only use for monitoring training trainings of the models, not for monitoring production models. So it's really for us now, mostly. It's a little bit of a glorified dashboard for <laughs> for the training successes and failures of the models, right? Yeah. It, I know it, um, MLflow can do much much more. Um, but yeah, currently we only use it for for monitoring training. Um, yeah, question: mm. When you store both prediction and confidence into Prometheus, is there expected to be some logic in your Grafana dashboard to interpret interpret sorry um, quality of prediction and generate the alerts? Um, yeah, you can. That is really, yeah. <laughs> again, um, well, it depends on. Can you tell that I had a career in consulting before? Everything depends on something. Right? Um, yeah, you can uh, you can build out logic for alerting in Grafana. Or um, you can build it yourself. Or you can use another tool for that. And that really, really depends on your infrastructure, your architecture and your surrounding systems and uh, how you tie everything together. 
And um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> sorry. Um, it what we are currently. I, I can only speak from my experience, right? So what we are currently doing is that we build um, that we build a little bit of custom logic to detect alerts, but we have, I would say, a more a more special use case, right? Because um, as I told in the beginning, what we are doing is that we are um, basically recording uh, LiDAR point clouds um, from, from, from trenches. So somebody dug a trench and put a cable in and with our device, you can basically scan that in 3D with, with also with LiDAR. Um, and then we have big point clouds and we mostly work on that. So that is a little bit... Um, yeah, a little bit unusual, I would say. So most of the stuff um, that you see in uh, in common use cases for ML is really images or text, audio, video, well, um, but or time series is also um, more common. But I think 3D point clouds is a really uncommon use case, and the the currently available tools are not really tailor-made for that. And that leads to more customized tools, of course. And I think that you can generalize that. If you have a more special use case, and that is not images, for example, uh, recognized images, um, you need to build more of this stuff yourself. Because potentially, Nobody else has the exact same use case. So the more special your use case is and the more exotic um, your data is, um, yeah, the more you really need to build tools yourself. All right, Great, JP. I guess, oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, there are more questions. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, there's, uh, yeah, there's more questions. Can I can I answer the last two or yeah, yeah? sure yeah, yeah sure um, go ahead. you you have to stop me when I'm over time so just uh, yeah you can answer out. the last two questions okay. and last question um okay so JP um I, I will try to answer quickly JP any advice for data scientists trying to become ML engineers um huh um Aren't you uh, already on, on on top of the totem pole? Uh, if you are a data scientist, <laughs> no, uh, really, I'm I'm coming from software engineering, and um, that is how I get my um, my entryway into ML engineering. So right uh, right from the other side. But I would say for um, for data scientists that are trying to become ML engineers, my, in my point of view, um, really try to get um, a little bit experience in. In DevOps or in Ops, even so, um, for for our environment, it would be okay. Le learn a little bit about about Docker. Learn a bit, little bit about Kubernetes. How Kubernetes work? How can you put some software into development in a in a cloud environment? Um, how can you put it in production in in testing? Um, so really, the the stuff that traditionally operations does. Um, if you get some some knowledge um, there, that I think is a good way to then become an awesome ML engineer because you already have the, uh, the 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 data science aspect of the of ML engineering or ML ops. Um, I think this is the, the the data science aspect is probably the harder part to learn. Um, the the more more ops part, I think, comes um, a little bit from experience, but you can uh, learn uh, a lot by yourself. So yeah, my my recommendation is um, first get some get some knowledge in in operations, uh, familiarize yourself with Docker Kubernetes, for example, um, and <laughs> with monitoring tools, of course, right? And um, yeah, then if you if you have time left and um, you want to learn more, then uh, I think the the next um, the next pillar is really um, more or deeper knowledge in software engineering. So traditionally boring software engineering stuff. How can you test stuff? How you can 
uh, how can you write um, productive, fast, and scalable software? Um, this is really the is basically the third pillar of of becoming a great ML engineer. I think I have no idea um, because I'm not a great ML engineer, but I am ML engineer probably. So yeah, um, I think that. Uh, you really, really need to build up the, these three pillars like data science, um, um, ops, and and software engineering. And when you have data science, I think the the um, um, the, the farthest uh, reach is really ops. So I think try that first. All right, and then the last question. Um, then uh, hi, you pronounce my name spot on. Great. I think now I pronounce it different, and now it's probably wrong. Uh, another question: How do you store models? Um, Ah, yes, that is <laughs> um, the the second use case for us for ML uh, flow um, with with ML flow. Uh, first, we just um, took a very very simplistic approach. I would say we just um, put them into Docker images. So we have had a model um, with all weights and just containerized it up in a Docker image with um, with a little bit of um, fast API code um, around it. So yeah, as that was the first approach, but now we are uh, we are using ML um, flow for that. Okay, I, I, these were all the questions from the F and F and A. Oh, ah, I think my Zoom is on uh, is in German. I, I was really confused about it. from the Q and A. <laughs> sorry, it's uh, Fragen und Antworten in in German. So yeah. I, German software or German language software confuses me. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, that was great presentation. Thank you. And people really stay till the end. So this is a great return. Appreciate your time and appreciate everyone's time. So please just tune in. We have more great events in the future. Hope to see everyone again. Thank you. Thanks a lot for having me. Thanks.